breaking the wall to science museums across the world. Charles Philip, Micromuseums, United States. I've always loved science, uh, and like many people, science museums are what first got me interested. Uh, I have an insatiable curiosity, and I love learning with my hands. I loved pulling levers and watching whirly gigs and collecting who's its and what's its galore. I loved learning facts about the world. As I got older, however, I learned some facts about museums, and they weren't all positive. On the one hand, museums are the most trusted source of public information. On the other, they tend to cluster in wealthier neighborhoods. For example, in New York City, Manhattan has 85 museums, whereas the Bronx, which has the same size population but is poorer, has eight. And even if you do live locally to a museum, expensive tickets often mean that you can't have access. These types of injustices, they go on and on and they add up. Uh, across the US, 90% of visitors to art museums are white. And even at the Smithsonian's amazing free museums, uh, almost 50% of adult visitors have a graduate degree or higher, something that only 10% of the broader population has. So my team and I looked at museums, this incredibly important source of public information, and we asked ourselves, what if we, from first principles, redesigned them to be a distributed fleet of tiny museums that were free to visit? So we built a tiny fleet of science museums, each one small enough to fit into a pre-existing space, but dense enough to still pack a punch. Working from a donated shipping container with the volunteer help of friends and dozens of scientists from across the globe, we got to work and we designed our prototype, the smallest mollusk museum. Mollusks are these slimy tentacled shapeshifters like the octopus and oysters and the giant squid. Their sci-fi vibes make them a great tour guide for a biology museum with a lesson. Almost 50% of extinctions since the 1500s have been our friends, the mollusks. We tested the museum across the city to see if people liked learning from it, and they did. So we started talking to laundromats and libraries and bus terminals to see if we could turn their waiting rooms and lobbies into spaces for social learning. When we partnered with a public hospital in the South Bronx, we became the borough's first and only science museum. Depressing, but true. And soon, families started coming. And then, much to our surprise, schools started to organize field trips <laughs> to our tiny museum in the lobby of a public hospital. <laughs> and the museum became so popular that we started hiring micro docents. <laughs> Uh, which were high schoolers from the local community that got to come and give hands-on programming at the museums after school. During the pandemic, we also created a guide that allowed anyone, anywhere, to turn objects in their own home into a tiny museum, like an empty Amazon box. We've received thousands of museums from across the globe on new topics like acorns or copyright law or the Great Barrier Reef, many from people who had never even been to a museum before. And the fleet of our museums were the only museums that stayed open throughout COVID because we were in essential spaces, meaning that as people lined up to get vaccinated, tens of thousands of them gathered around our museum, feeling a little less alone. With our micro museums, we've developed an incredibly impactful one-two punch. On the one hand, we're increasing the number of voices that contribute to public knowledge. On the other, we're increasing access to that knowledge. By sharing this model widely, we can collaborate with governments and NGOs and foundations <coughs> across the globe to help tell their stories, and hopefully some of the other presenters here today. Every spark of curiosity, each new fact learned, each empowered voice, it adds up to a stronger system. And that's the best tool that I can think of to help some of the world's biggest problems right now. Our goal is to become the most visited science museum in the world over the next few years, reaching a whole new audience and pulling down the walls to science education across the globe. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, so now let's take questions from the jury. And ah, there's Laura. <laughs> Thanks. It's amazing, Charles. I love what you're doing. Um, without the expensive museum tickets, what's your revenue model for this or your funding model for this? Yeah, well, we are a not-for-profit, uh, and we tend to work with foundations um, or corporate social responsibility groups um, or governments in order to get our funding. Um, they're always free to the public, um, and you know, we, we've managed to start building up a, a revenue stream that, that seems to work and help us to scale. Um, but we're always looking for partners that are interested in supporting us. And Agnes. Is it this limited size, is it also an impulse for innovation? So this limitation, what is your experience about it? Yeah. Um, design works best within confines, uh, and it's an incredibly interesting platform to innovate around. Um, you know, we, we essentially, because we're in a waiting room, we're competing against Candy Crush. <laughs> you know, we have to actually pull people in, and we do that through the same tools that advertising uses or something. We, we put really engaging, interesting, hands-on experiences. The museums themselves, the information is sort of uh, assembled by height. So at the bottom is uh, you know, holograms and optical illusions and, and whirly gigs and zoetropes that kids get glued to. And then we have their caretakers can sort of pick up some of the more sophisticated concepts. And then you get intergenerational communication and questions. And a question from Daryl. Can you talk a little bit about the co-creation process? Yeah, uh, so we very much view ourselves as a new medium that anyone can use. Um, you know, we, we really like to partner with trusted and established institutions um, that might be having an issue reaching out to communities. You know, so uh, we do a lot of community curation. We go into communities and we co-design with communities so that the museums are in by for communities. Um, so we often work with a trusted, established uh, institution within a, you know, like a science museum within a community. Uh, and then we work with community groups um, and we create this network um, that can help to, to really empower more voices. Jean-Claude? Who is overlooking the, 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 the science of, the, of what you show? I mean, someone must control that you don't say whatever. Yes. Uh, we, we have a museum manifesto, uh, which clearly outlines with any partnership you know, what it means to be a museum. We hold this title extremely strongly. Uh, and we put together an advisory team of uh, experts in the field. Um, we make sure that any partnership, uh, there's a very clear vetting process for the information to make sure that it is always cutting edge, but also always validated by researchers that are active in the field. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank this you. is your boss. Yeah.